super duper ice cream scoop pump. So, put your hand up if you like the shirt. Oh, I like the shirt. I've got shoes to match. I've even got socks to match. I'm not going to show you them. Put your hand up if you think I look a bit of an idiot in this shirt. <laughs> you know what? It takes a child, a student, to be honest, doesn't it? Parents are going, well, I think it, but I'm not going to say it, right? That's what people do. You filter, don't you? Don't want to upset. But in reality, this is the deal. I don't care what you think about the shirt. I mean, I hope we have a nice time together, but like in an hour and a half, I'm going back to my hotel and that's it, right? I might never see you again, so why would I worry? But we do, don't we? We worry about what people think. It's called The Gym Paradox. Has anybody read this book? No. So it's that guy, Steve Peters, he's now a professor. He is a psychiatrist, that's what, and he teaches. He's a teacher. And he's worked with people like Chris Hoy, the most successful Olympian of all time, British Olympian. Ronnie O'Sullivan, snooky guy. And he says that what, he came up with the concept teaching how we think. And he says that essentially we have two <coughs> things. We have a logical brain that works on information, and we have a chimp brain that works on emotion. The problem is the chimp brain overtakes a logical brain. Seven times more powerful. That's why we do things that we know we shouldn't. That's why we don't do the things that we know we should. We justify bad behaviour, and that's a chimp. And that's what the chimp does. So, as I travel all over the world, what I see is I see people come up with chimp comments. Now I've told you, you'll hear them everywhere. You'll hear them all the time. The chimp doesn't like facts. There's no statistics. There won't be a study, there won't be a survey, it'll just be a thought. Well, this is what I think. But thoughts are not facts, are they? <coughs> Two different things. So, as I travel all over the world, this is part of the challenge I face. Now, as a global speaker, particularly when it comes to memory, I go around and people say, oh, I've got bad memory. And I go, how bad? And they go, it's the worst in the world, mate. And I go, seven billion people, yours is the worst. And they go, yeah. And I'm going, wow. That is a tragedy of epic proportions. <laughs> Sometimes the sarcasm's wasted. But I like it. I like being sarcastic. I'm from Yorkshire. Is everybody from Yorkshire? We're born sarcastic, right? This is how we are. We come out sarcastic from birth. It's part of our heritage. So, the, my job is to show you how amazing your memory actually is. And give you chapters to prove it. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at a couple of techniques that improve your memory, improve your learning. But the first one we're going to look at is your little, lovely, beautiful brain. So, back in the day, we used to say that we have left was logical, part of the brain, right was creative. You remember that? Not true. That's now been debunked. That is a myth. With the advent of CAT scans and brain scans, we now know that's not true. But what we do know is that we have logical skills and we have creative skills. So logical skills are sequence, words, analysis, numbers, logic, lines and lists. Now we know those, don't we? Those are what we live by. Don't we? We go to work and we see documents, we see spreadsheets. But we also have creative skills. We've got colour. Wholeness. Have you ever done a crossword and you can't get the last two? How do you feel? You feel happy you got 26 right? No. Is that there you go? You go. Grinding <laughs> right your teeth, don't you, until you find those last two. Imagination. Rhythm. Daydreaming. Are we all good at daydreaming? Yes. Yeah. We're all class, aren't we? Dimension and spatial awareness. <coughs> so the problem is we've got all these gorgeous skills. These are what make us what we are. And yet, these are the ones that we focus on a lot. Because the two most important subjects are at school are. At school are. I mean you could have 48 GCSEs, but if you haven't got math and English, you ain't getting a job. Right? So that's all the words. But in reality, we should be trying to use as many of these as possible, especially when it comes to learning. The more that we use, the better we get. The problem is, this is how we started out. So what did books look like when we were five? They looked like that, didn't they? 
But what they did was they used the full range of skills. They're not like that because it's childish. They like that because that's the best way for the brain to develop. So it's got the logical skills. Things done in sequence, lines, or lists, his numbers, his words. But it's also colour, whole of space. Space is being used. Images. And it's the same the world over. Whether that's Australia. Mr. Men. <laughs> Remember Mr. Men? Yeah. Roger Hargreaves? Is this in the same class as my mother? That's cool, oddly enough. It's not my rich name. Even when you go a little bit further afield, Japan, that principle is the same, and even Iran, a very unusual country that's spoken in three different times. And the reality is, this is how we learn. But that's not how books look by the time you get to high school, or certainly by the time you leave in high school. So if I go and get some study guides from the shop, right, for kids, for students, it's key stage one, five years old, 90% images. GCSE, year 11, 15, 16 year old, 90% words. The problem is the way that we think, the way that our brain operates has not changed in the interim period. So what we're going to look at first, we're going to look at two things tonight. The first one is mind mapping. Does anybody not know what mind mapping is? So mind mapping is a way of expressing information on a page. It was first devised in 1973 and it came out of spider diagrams from the 650s and 60s. So what you do is you start in the centre of the page and you branch out. I've taught this to half a million students in 24 countries over 22 years. And for the four or five hundred students that we follow and that we've got feedback from, there has not been one who has not improved using mind mapping. It is awesome. It is stunning. I mean, the, one of the very top two or three um, testimonials of that was here. First came, when I first came out ten years ago with Pete, I was working with one student here, I won't say who it was for various reasons, but she showed me her practice papers and she did a maths paper, she got 3 out of 25. She used mind mapping and it went up to 24 out of 25. And you go, well maybe it's this or that or the other. But she was able to articulate, show me the mind maps and show me how she went from 3 to 24. Now that's unusual, but the average is 15%. That's a grade and a half. By the time you get to GCSE, those really count. So if I could only ever teach one thing ever again, it would be mind mapping, because it's amazing. Not only that, but it's an amazing lifelong business skill. And that's something I'm going to share with you very quickly as well. So what does it do? For me, it comes down to one thing. It controls information and ideas. Because we have access to an unlimited amount of information, and we can create an unlimited number of ideas. We know the value of an idea. On the back of my iPhone, it says, made in China, designed in California. China make $50, California make $500. If you take all the money that Microsoft, Apple, Oracle, SAP, the big tech guys have got, not the, not the shareholder value, the cash, it's over one trillion dollars. That's the value of an idea. So we understand, how do we control that? How do we manage to control it and make it work for us? So that's a mind map, very <coughs> simple. So mind maps look a bit, a bit kiddish, don't they? A bit childish. They look a bit nice, pretty pictures and colours. But the problem is, is that what people do is when they start using mind mapping, they go off at a tangent. They do it their way. If you do mind mapping at all, and it doesn't look like that, it's wrong. Not just because I say so. That sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it, right? Not that that's bothered me before. But the reality is, is it's a neurological exercise. So it's based on neurological principles, not creative ones. It's not, it can be used for creativity. But it's not, a create, it's not a creative thing in itself. So it's very, very simple. You start in the centre and you branch out. The words go on top of the line. Each branch is a different colour. You write it in capitals. And the branch is connected at the end. So when you do a branch, no matter how many branches you've got coming out, they must follow the sequence. So you do a branch and the next ones come out at the end. That's it. Easy peasy, let it squeeze it, right? But people go off at tangent, then it doesn't quite work. But that is how it should be. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some applications, how it can be used, 
what it's for, etc. And I'll start off, I'm going to cut, obviously there's a lot of students in the room, I'm going to show you how to use it for exams, because that's not my thing. But I'm going to also show you for some of the adults in the room, just in case. So, first things first, training. So I've worked with many pharmaceutical companies in the UK, it's one of the niches I work in, and what they've used it for is training. So they managed to get a three day course down to a two day course, and increase the retention of the people in the room by 15%. So it's a very effective way of training to get across. That was me in Iran in 2014. I'm the only keynote speaker on the first day, that's me in the top right. I was organising an event with a local guy, we had a thousand business attendees. On the second day, I'm the open keynote speaker again. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm teaching mind mapping. So I mind map the whole of the first day. That's six hours of material down onto one piece of A4 that takes me 20 minutes to go through on day two. This is important when it comes to revision for the students. It takes longer to create the mind map in the first place, but it takes a fraction of the time to go through for revision. So even though you spend a little bit longer doing the mind map than you would normal bullet notes, it takes only five or 10% of the time to go through it because you're taking out most of the information. We can take any study guide where the information is already highly condensed, take out 80% and the students still understand what it is and the retention goes up 15%. <coughs> Business strategy meeting, very simple, a major bakery in England. I was a, the guy was in the room and I said, you know, bakery, I like bakery, I like bakery stuff, right? I said, I like hot cross buns, he said, we make hot cross buns. I said, how many? He went, 32 million. <coughs> 32 million, he went, yeah. I said, so you're not in the back room, why are you doing them? He said, oh, right now. <laughs> so, this is a big strategy meeting, bigger way a day, full, full team, management team, and then, so what they have is three different branches, how to grow sales, how to make the team fit for the future, and how to make the bakery fit for the future. That's not the first version. Mind mapping is amazing to do a brain dump. So what you do is all the ideas that you've got amongst your team, in yourself, dump it all on the page, and then you work it out again afterwards. It's fantastic, because it's amazing. Because you can, you're only putting down the core parts, it helps you understand things in the round. Instead of sometimes, I don't know how you guys do it, if you do have strategy means at work, but sometimes people put post-it notes up, or they put big white sheets up, and they just go in bullet points, you lose the thread. Group mind mapping. Again, one of the pharmaceuticals I was working with was bringing an asthma drug to market, and it was a billion dollar product. And they brought it to, to market three months early using mind mapping. They had a team of 500 people, they all used mind mapping individually, brought it together, and it was very successful. I know that's a very pixelated picture, but this was used by, um, an, um, this is used by an aircraft manufacturer. And what they found is that by using it, they were able to really condense the amount of time it took to learn what the information was uh, for the uh, engineers. And in the first year, 1993, that's why it's like a bad picture, they saved $11 million. So yeah, we're talking about effectiveness for learning, we're talking about how it can improve your time management, but actually in the business world, we found that it has a huge impact on costs. So this is a, a guy who was on the course as well. So I showed him mind mapping, and I, he sat there and he said, uh, you know what, I'm gonna use mind mapping tomorrow. He'd never done it before. He said, I'm gonna use it tomorrow. I said, what are you gonna use it for? He said, got a massive sales pitch. And I said, so you're gonna use mind mapping tomorrow for a massive sales pitch, but you've never used it before? He says, yeah. I says, I don't think that's a good idea. And he said, but you, you talk about like, you know, push yourself out there, get out of your comfort zone. I said, well, I said it, but I didn't really mean it. Why did you not say Really? He went, no, no, I couldn't go for it there. So we'll make sure you get in touch, tell me how it went. So he said, I did a pitch. I used to man up the day after you, after you spoke to pitch at a new business meeting. It went really well. So much so that the guy asked him to repeat his pitch. Now, is anybody in this room who's ever sold anything in their life, you know that is what is known as a buying signal. If somebody said, tell me all that again, you're in. But not only did they do that, in the video, he said, and he videoed me to show his colleagues, this is a good thing. But what was interesting is he said, why? Why are you videoing me? And the guy turned around and said, because nobody's done that before. 
So the thing is, a lot of stuff in life is trying to is trying to se is trying to separate separate yourself from everybody else, isn't it? You know, for the students in the room, I'll make a very simple point. You're in a very homogenised environment. You're all in it together. You're all doing the same thing. You're wearing the same uniform. But the moment you step out and you're into the real world, the reality is, is you've got to find a way to be different or better or both than everybody else. Because if there's ten people outside an office and one job, you'd better be the best. Because it's no, it's not fair. All the elements in the room, it's not, life's not fair, is it? Bad things happen to good people. You start the job at the same time as somebody else, you outwork them, they get promoted first. Right? That's how it works. That wouldn't happen in gym, would it? Because everything's super fair here. Yeah? It's not incestuous at all, is it? Was that too much? Then I ruffle some feathers. I'm going in an hour. So. <laughs> You just don't, don't care too much about what people think, don't care. See, exactly, you, know, you become beige, don't you? You meet people, you talk about the weather and traffic. You do, don't you? You want to hear about my journey from the UK on Monday? No. Well, I don't want to hear about your journey here tonight, then, but all right. <laughs> right, studying. What's the students in the room? This is where the action is, right? Year nine. Cells. So this has been by a student, so if parents paid me, I went into the house, this, this lad sat there, two hours, didn't say a word, Friday <coughs> afternoon, private school, I was supposed to be playing golf, he wasn't happy. So he sat there and just stared, but he did, he kind of did the exercises and did what he was told. But then his mother made him do it. Two weeks later, I get this email, and he, he, he attaches a mind map and he said, Dave, apply what you did, and I got an increase of 20% of the test. Didn't say thank you. <laughs> that was too much to hope for. But at least he got a result. Very simply. English. Where do you use capitals? Now you could just put down names, places, countries, companies, days and months. But what we've done is we've got a little example. And then what we've done is put a little picture in. Because we know that the brain remembers images far greater than it does statistics. Why? Because of the 14 brain skills. If I give you a word, you're only using one brain skill, which is words. <coughs> I give you an image, you're using 10. So 17 years ago, my brain was tested at University College in London. This is one of the exercises that we did. So what we did was we had to write a word, see how much brain activity it was. Then we had to draw a picture and see how much brain activity it was. Obviously, it's much higher. This is a very, very simple premise. The more of your brain that you use to learn something, the more of your brain you've got to access to be able to pull it back out. That's why my mapping works. Because when you've got black bullet points, pages and pages, you're only using two or three brain skills, all logical. And my map uses 10, 11 or 12. So we've had students who've had two, maybe 300 mind maps going into their GCSEs, and they can remember every single one. Because Pages of bullet points look the same. Every mind map is unique. Uh, <coughs> can I ask something? Please. Going back to that one, what exactly are we mind mapping here? English? Yes. Just when English you use, in general. It's when you use capitals. <coughs> so in the middle we've got... Why have we got Monday and a book and a pencil there? Because Monday... Because it says that you've got to use capitals when you use the word Monday. And then on a Monday is when you go to school. So as an anchor, as something to help you remember that it's Monday, we start in school. On a Saturday, we put football, uh, rugby ball, because it's more likely you're going to play rugby on a weekend. I don't understand capitals with Monday. I don't understand the logic there. Because they don't need a capital. They're proper names. Capitals mean capital letters, not capital letters. Sorry, I don't understand. That's alright. But the point, the point of the mind map is that mind map is showing you when you should use capitals. Oh, capital, capital that's letters. Yes. When I should use capitals. Yes. Alright, oh, okay. My apologies, I should have explained more. So when you use them, you use them when you when you use the names, our places, countries, companies, dates, and months. Okay? So an 
example for your, this is um, your <coughs> biology, obviously, blood vessels. Straight away you can see the three different types of blood vessels. One is arteries, so we've got an artist's palate. Again you go, wow, that's a bit childish, it's whatever. But these are the things that your brain remembers when you're in the exam. So what does that mean? I can't use my clicker because it's a screen. What does that mean? Rings. Yes. So when it comes to archery, walls be strong. Those are the things you know. So when it comes to capillary, we just put a caterpillar in because it sounds a bit similar. Because all you need is a hook. People think you need the exact word, no you don't. You just need something that gets you from there to there. It's a stepping stone. Coastal weathering. No idea what that is. I, think, I really didn't do very well at school. <laughs> Mechanics. That is so far beyond me. <laughs> but my missus got a maths degree. She's a bright one. Right. Market failures. I'm kind of thinking that's economics. <coughs> <coughs> quadratic equations. Now, interestingly, I've always said that <coughs> yeah, mapping doesn't really work for maths, but, the, oh no, but so what somebody did here was just take the maths and put it onto the mind map. Now, the advantage of mind mapping is you take this much information, you make it this big. But when you do that with mind map, maths, that doesn't work because it already was this big and it's still this big. So I don't even know why it worked, but the guy said it worked for him. Who knew? Who knew, right? <laughs> Definitions of something. <laughs> I just collect mind maps. I've got thousands of them, so I don't know what it means. They, so degradation, I and mean, it's fairly obvious, right? These geography is so crazy. This is A-level maths, uh, A-level biology, cell cycle, and then there's one on heart disease. And this is quite interesting to me. <coughs> people always say, is it better to use software? And I always go, no, you do with the one that works for you. And almost everybody prefers to do it with hand-drawn. But there's some great software, some great software. <coughs> But people prefer to do it hand drawn. But what this girl said was, what she didn't want to do was try and draw a heart. What she wanted was a proper copy. So she drew the hand mind map, scanned it in, put some pictures in from Google. So kind of a bit of a mix and match. Is that a good or a bad mind map? Wow. That's terrible, right? That was done by a head of history in a school. So in, in, this is a few years ago now, when back in the day when GCSEs were, were graded A to, you know, A to whatever, A to E or whatever, I guess. And in this school, <coughs> the, the pass rate was 93% for five GCSEs. The average in the country was only 63. So there were already high performing students, high performing teachers, great school. And so this, so I'm stood there in front of all these teachers and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm studying because I'm assuming you don't really want any help. I've got crushed in the rush, right? And the head of the district came up and he said, I'm already using mind maps. And they said, awesome, show me some. And he got like 50 of these, like 50 of these mind maps. And he said, he made a mistake. He asked me what I thought, right? So I told him, because nobody ever wants your opinion, do they? <coughs> like literally nobody. Karen doesn't want it, the missus, the kids don't want it. I'm still telling them though. You know what I mean? I'm the boss. So, let's just look at me and go, damn, go away. So, nobody wants your opinion, but somebody asked me, I'm dead honest. So, I told them what I thought, in no certain terms, I said, fine, I'll have a go at doing it your way. So, we did, we changed it, and that's what it ended up looking like. Which isn't perfect. Some words are underneath the line at the bottom left, but it's quite nice, it's a lot better. Now, the whole point of this is right, I'm not teaching you mind mapping now because it's a nice, fluffy idea. I'm doing it because I want you to get some hard benefits. And what the guy said was, he said, I'm not going to change unless I get a benefit. Almost nobody changes without a massive benefit or massive pain. Would you agree? We don't change if it's a little bit of benefit. Not only because we don't like change, we like to change, right? So he said, I'm going to test the kids. So we did. Got the brightest kids, A star students, five, uh, followed them for eight weeks, and they went up 11% in eight weeks. What was interesting to me was this. He then applied it across the board. He did it, he did the mind maps for the students and he did it for every single class. And over an 18 month period, I went in, didn't get paid, went to work with him because I want raging fans. I want people who love what I do, so I'll share my time with them. 
and we spent 18 months together working on it every month and it went to 15% average across the board. 100 teachers were in that school. How many teachers do you think came up to him and asked him how he did it? Zero. Yeah. I know. Because people are under pressure. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in schools over the years and I'll tell you what, you only crack the joke once about how many holidays I get. Just once. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, before we have a little break, we're going to have a break, is I'm going to just share a little bit of background about me. So that's me, as a kid. I'm the one on the right. <laughs> in case you think I wear a dress on a weekend. <laughs> so my mother in that picture is 23 years old. And at that point she was addicted to drugs and alcohol. That destroyed the marriage to my father. And then she remarried a guy who was 35 years older than her. He was 65 when I was six. Um, between them, they made my life a living hell for 12 years. So by the time I got to 16, I'm getting involved with the police, I'm committing crime, I nearly killed a police officer one night, coming out and shot that being burglary. And so I end up with a criminal conviction and I get expelled from school. <coughs> I think David could be a disturbing influence. <laughs> so I'm 16, I've got no qualifications, I've, got, you know, I've never been to university, never been to college and so I'm out there working in the factory packing um, Christmas gifts into a box for a pound an hour. I get the job as working in an office for two pounds an hour eventually and then at 20 things changed, I became a fireman. So I became an operational firefighter at the age of 20 and it was fantastic So I'm just a northern working class monkey, right, I'm just a working class lad from Halifax. So for me, this was top of the food chain. Because all my mates were plasterers, brick and sparkies, and all of a sudden, I had credibility. Plus, for every 40 people that applied to become a fireman, only one got in. So I was in that top 2.5%, slipped through the neck, don't know how, and I got into the fire service. So it was a great job, I loved being a fireman, but I wasn't very bright. So you know how everybody has a nickname in the fire service? And this is true, right? Everything I'm telling you is true. Everybody has a nickname, right? And my nickname in the fire service was Thrombo, which was short for thrombosis, as in a slow-moving plot. <laughs> 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 I think that's what I'm really right? That's awesome. Like, it's, it's, it's funny, but really cruel, isn't it? My sense of humour is pitch black. It's dark, as you can imagine. So, it was funny, even if it was about me, it was still funny. And I kept filling the exams, I sat the promotion exams a few times and I kept failing them. And I sat there in front of an officer one day and he said, you're never going to pass. You sat there three times, you're never going to pass, I'm like, fine. Because the problem is we listen to other people, we listen to other influences. So I had my parents who said, oh, that would be good, the school kicked me out, the fire service said, you're not going to get promoted. But the problem is, there's no pay and there's no benefit. I was in the middle, I was half pay, I would have been a fire and I thought, this is it, 30 years, I already retired three weeks ago at the age of 50. And I just thought, this is all right. This, I love it. I love it. I wasn't interested in cows or money or material goods. I didn't give the kids any of that business. So I just kind of drifted on. And then I got to 28 years old. And one night I'm watching TV and I saw a guy memorize a pack of playing cards on television. And I was like, that is amazing. I forgot to learn how to do that. Because the guys would like that at work, right? Peter of pressure. So I went out, I bought this guy's book, and I taught myself how to improve my memory. Eight months later, I went to the World Memory Championships and came forth. Wow. Okay, I came in the top three in five out of ten events. I memorised 130 words in five, 15 minutes. I memorised 160 digits in five minutes. I memorised a pack of cards in 75 seconds. I memorised 14 packs of cards in an hour. And I memorised 1300 digits in an hour. This was eight months after spending six quid on a book. <laughs> One year before, I couldn't remember 13 things on a fire extinguisher. Now I can memorise 1,300 digits and sit there and go, what's going on? Because it just got, it all got a bit ridiculous. And then of course, worst thing in the world that happened to me is I found ambition. I had no ambition. Then all of a sudden that was good. So you know, I went on this competition on a Friday, it's a hobby in my back bedroom. On the Monday I'm getting made by a million people in the Times. And it just fueled my ego. I oh, thought, this is amazing. Because everybody's telling me I'm amazing. 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 Right? And ambition is a terrible thing. Ambition is kids, ambition is terrible. Because you're never happy. It's just like, what have you get? It's not enough. It's like, oh, everything I do, it's like it's gone. It's never happened. I mean, I'm a very happy guy. I am happy. I'm happy. Right? I'm eternally satisfied. You know that kind of feeling. 
So this is 96, 97 came around and went back to the World Championships, came third. And then 1998 came around and I was guaranteed to come second in the world but not win. I thought, who, who, doesn't, who competes not to win? I thought, if I'm not winning, I'm not competing. And people are going, you know that's second in the world. I went, I don't care. I'm not competing. So what I decided to do, I didn't compete, which is ridiculous, right? I should have at least gone and got a silver medal. It would help the time. But what I decided to do was do something different. I did a Guinness record. I said, no, no, Guinness records, so Guinness book of records. So I broke a Guinness record for reciting pi. So you know what pi is? <coughs> Most of you? Dim and distant past, people going, what's he talking about? You did maths at school, right? You went to a maths class, didn't you? When you were 16. You learn what pi is. 3.14? It goes on forever, right? No patterns in it. Perfect for memory, guys, like me. So on the 1st of May 98, I broke a Guinness record for reciting pi to 22,500 digits. <coughs> yeah, that was me. It took me six hours a day for six months to learn. Now what do you think is what a... What motivated you? What motivated me? It's a stick with that. I just wanted to be the best. Yeah. Absolutely, just wanted to be number one. I wanted to be the best in the world and that's all I wanted. It just, my ambition raged and it just overtook everything. So even though I was spending <coughs> six hours a day learning this number, I was fine and I had a missus, two kids, I was getting up at four in the morning to learn a number. But it was just like, if I get this, this there's something going to happen. I knew it was going to be big. I had no idea how big, and it just went nuclear. And I'll share that with you in a minute, because it changed my life forever. To this day, it's the number one thing that people recognise, but 21 years later. <coughs> so what I can feel in the room is that there's a deep need to hear some pie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my show, I do what I want, all right? It's not a question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recite these 150 digits to show you just how much fun we really did have that day. I can give you a good time. You ready? <laughs> Better keep focused. 141 Keep it up. <laughs> Focus. By the way, it's, it's not focus, it's focus. It's cool, it's cool, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. 6932 have no friends. <laughs> got two. All right. Give me a little. Got two. It's all you need when you're 50. But well, you know what, you kids, you think you need? Oh, just two. Two by the time you So, it was amazing because it just, it just changed my life overnight. I got a book deal. The first one came out, sold 120,000 copies, which is a lot. And the second one came out, autobiography. It went in the morning in the Sunday Times. And Number two there is Colleen McLaughlin, who was Wayne Rooney's wife, the footballer. She was coming out, she was coming out with the same publisher as me, and I was out selling her two to one. That's mad in it, right? You know, when you're looking, you go, how on earth does this stuff happen to me? But it did, so I made it happen. So I made it happen. I got a green card, went and lived in America on and off for 10 years, lived in New York, in Manhattan, and I was there into the US Memory Championships and won. And I also have done over 500 media appearances. Been in, even been in the Jib Chronicle. Kick me! <laughs> 18 people have read that. Come on! <laughs> and even managed to get on the Oprah Winfrey Show. <laughs> I know, everybody's going, it's just daytime TV. No, it isn't. It isn't. It's 200 million people with a daytime TV. So, what was interesting to me is that. I find all this stuff, I kind of find all this stuff in, right? Just keep going, going for it, going for it, going for it. But what I realised early doors is that, I don't know why I realised or not or whatever, but I just realised that actually somebody, need, somebody needs to be number one. And it might as well be me. <laughs> so I just went for it. So I went for a Guinness record, trying to get number one and I did. And then when I got a book deal, what I did was I found the number one publisher and the number one editor in the publishing house and I phoned a direct. 
I said, hi, you don't know me, my name's Dave, I've got a book, can I send you the synopsis? She went, yeah. Three days later, 100,000 quid. 18 months later, number one. A million people have read the book. Because I went for number one. Because I found out who number one was. Same with the Oprah show. How do you think I got on the biggest TV show in history? Email the show. <laughs> I just went on Oprah.com. <laughs> you just can't even say it without laughing because it sounds really insane, doesn't it? But there's no barriers to entry now, is there? You can find anybody on the internet. So I go on the internet and I just went on the website and I emailed them. I said, hi, my name's Dave. I'm really good at memorizing cards and numbers. <laughs> they went, I said, can I come on the show? And they went, go on then. I'm like, <laughs> like two weeks later, I'm in a, on a playbook in Chicago and I meet Oprah Winfrey. And I mean, you know, I'm talking about Met Metro as well, because if you've ever done TV, the way it works is that you go and you, you get put in the green room with all the other fodder, right? And then you just get tick, a runner come in, comes and gets you, takes you to the stage, you meet the famous person, they look at you like they're going to spit on you, and then you do the piece of TV, the runner takes you back and they leave you in the green room. So you don't really meet the famous people. But what they wanted to do was test me. So they wanted to test me, so I had to get there early, so I was there in the morning on my own. And I'm little, like a little mezzanine area on my own, and I'm just waiting to get picked up by one of the, one of the producers. And Oprah Winfrey walks out the door. Now, if you know anything about this woman, you'll know something of her history. She had a terrible childhood, born into incredible poverty. She went to work for AB, I think it was ABC, the network. The show got cancelled. She decided to syndicate the show which really is not a good way to do a TV show, but what happens when you syndicate it is you own the rights. So when you sell it to all these individual TV stations all over the country and all over the world, you keep all the money. So when I went on that show, Simon Cowell was making a million dollars a week. She was making a million dollars a day. And you just see this woman walk out the door and you go, oh my God, that's over. And she, walked, she looked at me, and there's just the two of us, you know, you expect bouncers or whatever, don't you? And she just went, who are you? And I went, I'm Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, I said, who are you? And she went, I'm Oprah. I went, I know, see you on TV. <laughs> and she thought that was great, right? Because nobody takes a mickey out of Oprah. It's not, that, that, that's a, that doesn't happen. So we had a great time. Lovely woman, fantastic. People don't get to that level without creating this amazing team and getting a balance, you know what I mean? And while I was living in New York, I lived on the same street as Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, people say, did you meet her? No, I did not meet her. They're kind of famous. It's all bulletproof cars, right? <coughs> Even I went to stuck my nose up at the window. <laughs> right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a 15-minute break. So it's quarter past, back at half past. Then we're going to look at a bit of memory stuff at the after the break.